If you didn't notice, I'm an old guy. And I, in, Jan, in June the 1st, I celebrated my 50th year in the insurance industry. And I know most of you have parents who aren't 50 years old, but I've been in the insurance industry for uh, 50 years. So the good news is you can spend half a century in this industry and still look this good. <laughs> I, uh, to celebrate my 50th year, I decided to write a book last year called When Words Collide. I, um, I started out, one of the interesting things about you guys is you, you have chosen the insurance industry. I'm going to talk about that topic this afternoon. Very few people in the insurance industry chose to be in it, planned on it, went to school to study to be in it. You kind of slip in the back door. Same thing for me. Uh, I started out as an engineer. I got my degree in engineering, especially was fire protection engineering. So that's how I started doing work for insurance companies. And uh, they, they told me that you need to get the CPCU designation so you can speak the lingo of the insurance industry. So I did it and I got hooked on insurance. I abandoned a, a fabulous engineering career to go into the coverage side of insurance. And for the last 30 years, I've worked for uh, the Independent Agent Association, the big I, helping insurance agents get denied claims paid. And that's what my book is about and what I'm going to talk about. But I wanted just to connect with you. I was once young. <laughs> one of those guys you see there is me. Anybody guess which one it is? Yeah, very few people get it. I'm the second guy from the left. I'm actually standing on a stool because I'm, I'm not that tall and these guys are all over six feet. That was my band in college. Uh, I, I semi-retired at the end of 2016 to write the book and uh, one of my bucket list items was to uh, start a band again. I, the last time I played the band was 1973 and I now play in a band called The Spiders. We just got our first radio airplay recently. And it's funny because when we, when we play a gig, I'm in the Nashville area, we'll play a gig and uh, everybody expects a bunch of old guys to play you know, bluegrass or John Denver or the country or something like that. We play Billy Idol and Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and all that stuff. So we start playing and the people in the kitchen come out to look to see what we're, what we're, we're who we are, whether they're playing music or is that really us? And it's, it's really us. But I just wanted to let you know that I've, I've been where you are. And I'm going to talk about that this afternoon, about uh, the, the fact that you have chosen wisely going into the insurance industry. What my talk about it this morning, oh, there's my, uh, there's my bandmates, the Spiders. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook. The, uh, I passed a card, kind of a promo card around. Does, if you'll look on the back of that card, does anybody have something written on the back of theirs? You should because one of those cards has uh, RTFP written on it. So, <laughs> Whoever has the stack, look through it real quick. <laughs> yeah. And some, anywhere, some, uh, anyway, somewhere here there is that thing and if you have it, there we go, right there. He finally admits he thought I was going to call on him in some way to <laughs> single out. You actually win a signed copy of my book and uh, by signing it I've, I've dramatically increased the market value by se <laughs> 70, 80 cents maybe. So if you want to get your book, the good news is that Thank for, you, yeah, you're welcome. For any of the rest of you, uh, if you will put your email address on the back of that card and give it to me, I will send you an Amazon code for a free Kindle edition of the, of the book. It is fascinating reading. It's, uh, if you've ever read any Stephen King novels, it's, it's a page turner, but way scarier than anything that Stephen King ever wrote. Uh, I've only got about a half an hour or so with you, so I want to kind of give you an overview of what the book is all about. It's about resolving coverage disputes. Uh, whether you go into underwriting claims, and I, I'm talking about P&C here, not life and health. If you go into underwriting or, or claims, or, or you're an agent, sales, service, whatever, 
uh, at some point you're going to get involved in the claim process. So my book is about how you resolve a claim, largely a disputed claim, and I'll talk in a minute about the different types of claims that are available. So this is what I'm going to try to cover. When I originally put this program together, I thought I had an hour, then I found out I had 40 minutes, and now after setup and all that, I'm down to, I don't know what time it is, but, but I got about 30 minutes left. So if uh, we're supposed to be through at 11.50, if everybody with five minutes to go would go like this, then I'll know that I need to start wrapping it up. I'll probably not get through everything that I wanted to, but I'll try to get to the important stuff and make you consider, uh, if you haven't decided for sure what you want to do in the industry, a career that involves claims. And even though I've worked with independent insurance agents for 30 years, most of my work was working with them, working with claims adjusters. And I'll come back to that in a, in a couple of minutes. So where it all begins, and it doesn't matter what you do in the P&C insurance industry, whether you're actuary, underwriter, claims, uh, an expert witness, which I do a lot of work as, um, or, or education or whatever, everything goes back to the insurance policy. That's the basis for everything we do in this industry, the insurance contract, that controls the price, it controls the coverage, et cetera. You probably have studied insurance policies in your curriculum. You've read insurance policies, and I know you were fascinated and mesmerized as you read those policies, so they're, they're also very interesting. And hearing your profession, professors explain what's covered and what's not covered, I'm being facetious. Uh, but to me, it is fascinating. And it, it's fascinating if you read an insurance contract in the context of something that actually happened with a claim. I'll, I'll talk in a second, time permitting, and hopefully time will permit. Um, anybody ever used a riding lawnmower? Have you ever wondered, as happened to my next door neighbor, he ran over a screwdriver that was left in the grass, stripped the plastic handle off, and the steel shaft ended up in a tree about 10 feet from where my son shot basketball. Imagine if that was my son and not the tree or me or whatever. So accidents happen with riding lawnmowers. Do you ever wonder when you're using one whether your homeowner's policy covers you if something like that happens? I'm going to show you that there is no simple answer to that because insurance is not a commodity. It's not all the same based, the only difference being price. It's not a commodity, so I'll give you an example a little bit later on of how important coverage is and how easy it is to have disputes about whether something is covered or not. Two ways to deal with claim disputes. When I do, uh, when I do seminars and so forth, I like to quote from movie classics. I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie Roadhouse, how it didn't win 15 or 20 Academy Awards, I don't know, but it's about, about a venue with a bunch of bouncers, and Dalton is the head bouncer. Early in the movie, he gets a knife fight, he gets cut up, he goes to the hospital, the doctor treating him, he carries with him his medical dossier of all of his previous knife wounds and bullet wounds and so forth, and she looks at his medical file and asks him, do you ever win a fight? And he says, nobody ever wins a fight. And that's one of the points I make in the book, that you don't want to have a coverage dispute, particularly from a claim standpoint, because even though one side will win, it's covered or it's not covered, just going through the process is, can be emotionally draining. And that's why we want to try to prevent the dispute from ever happening. And the way you do that is by having the proper coverage in place. That's something if you're an underwriter or an agent that you'll be directly involved with. And I'll, I'll come back to that point with this slide that uh, there are two ways to deal with claim disputes. You can prevent them from happening, or you can resolve them if they do happen. And I don't have time to go through. There are actually seven uh, bases for prevention that I talk about in the book. I mentioned th really three here. Uh, and the first one, the foundational premises, I'm going to talk about this afternoon. The other, other two, real quickly, policy form drafting. I said before that everything begins with the insurance contract. So how well that insurance contract is written determines sometimes whether you're going to have a dispute or not. Uh, in your classes, if you reviewed insurance policies, they were most likely ISO, Insurance Services Office Forms. They're the industry standards. I worked for ISO for 15 years early in my career when I got out of engineering. And uh, a lot of companies write their own forms. Some of them write them not good. 
They write them poorly. And as a result, you often have questions when claims arise about whether a, a word or a phrase or provision is ambiguous or not. And I'll come back to that later. So form drafting is critically important. Uh, exposure analysis. Anybody planning on going into the agency ranks, insurance agencies or brokerage houses? It's always a tiny percentage. And if you saw the, the keynote this morning, that's where the big money is. If you want to make a lot of money in insurance, sell insurance with an insurance agency or brokerage house, and you will be making, in short order, particularly in commercial insurance, six-figure salaries. And you can make those in, in your early 20s. But uh, that's where part of the process is, identifying exposures. You, you may have read something about insurtex with Lemonade and Hippo, Slice, and so forth. I blog for my website, and on my last slide, I'll give you the link to my website and my email address if you want to follow up with me on anything. I write about InsureText, I blog about it fairly often, and I'm rarely complimentary to InsureText. Not that I don't like technology, I have every iteration of the iPod and I've got the, the, the best iPhone, I, I love technology, I had a, a personal computer before IBM ever created a personal computer. So I love technology, but one of the things that they don't do is exposure analysis. How do you know that you're properly insuring somebody's exposures to loss if you've done nothing to assist them? I did a homeowner's quote through a Slice, one of the InsureTech companies, and they use big data. For my homeowner's quote, they got big data from a real estate website who got it from county tax records, and the county tax, tax records had understated my square footage of my home by 1,200 square feet. So if I bought a policy from them, I, I estimate I would have been about $180,000 underinsured because they didn't do exposure analysis for the value of my property, for my liability exposures, et cetera. The uh, Lemonade said they can place your homeowner's insurance in 90 seconds. Uh, Hippo says they can do it in 60 seconds. There's a company that says they can do it in 10 seconds. Uh, there are companies that say that. There aren't any companies that can do that and do it correctly. Exposure analysis is where it all starts, and that usually starts at the production ranks in the, the sales personnel at the point of sale. Uh, then you have to properly insure it, know what poly policy forms to request from the carrier if you're in production. And then I tell agents to quality control the policies that come back. You want to make sure that everything you ask for from the company from underwriting is what was actually delivered. But even more important, the company will attach forms and endorsements that you don't ask for because they're mandated perhaps by their underwriting guidelines or rating rules or whatever. So you have to look particularly at the exclusionary endorsements that are attached because often they can be negotiated off the contract. Sometimes for free, if, you, if you're with an agency that has clout with a carrier, sometimes you can pay a little extra in premium. But the idea is to try to identify exposures to loss and insure them or risk manage them as best as you possibly can. If you do that, you will probably prevent many disputes. Not all of them because every insurance policy has exclusions. There are always going to be claim denials because something happens that the adjuster feels is not covered. So that's where my book comes in, that's where my career the last 30 years comes in because the adjuster is not always right. Or the adjuster has one opinion and there's more than just one opinion about whether there's coverage or not. That's where we get into resolution and I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later too. Uh, David Copperfield's a book by Charles Dickens and in the book there is a line that says accidents will occur in the best regulated families. No matter how good you are at preventing uncovered claims and disputes that arise from that, they're always going to happen. And again, that's why I wrote the book. It's 356 pages with 160 claims examples and it explains how in detail you resolve those, usually successfully. It's written from the standpoint of the policyholder and the agent that are trying to get coverage. But I tell people that if you're in claims with a company that you can use the same principles and doctrines I talk about in the book to explain to a policyholder why there isn't any coverage. They think that everything's covered, or it should be, based on them paying premiums every year, but it's not always covered. So why are claims denied? Four reasons. The first one is there are people in our industry that aren't ethical, that are crooked. There are people like that in every industry. 
So you, you learn to live with, there are claims that are denied. There was a claim, I live in Tennessee, where a lady had a fire, $26,000 loss. The adjuster said it was worth $13,000. She found out after he wrote her a check for $13,000 that that didn't come close to being able to do the repairs. So there ended up being a lawsuit. They found a note in the file where the adjuster said, I lowballed the lady into accepting $13,000. Use the word lowball. This was an elderly uh, widow. Uh, she ended up getting the other $13,000 and $3 million in punitive damages. So companies know that companies culturally, they're, they're, companies don't operate that way because they know the risks are too great. They can have their certificate of authority removed, they can go to jail, et cetera. So it happens, but it's incredibly rare, I believe. The most common one is they're not covered because every policy has exclusions. If they didn't, th it would be unaffordable if they covered everything. So usually it's not covered if the claim is denied and usually the adjuster is right. But sometimes there are legitimate differences of opinion I'll get to in a second. There's one other reason, I call it uh, cranial inversion. And the medical term is cranitis rectal inversio. Sometimes you get claim denials that just baffle the senses. I've, over 30 years, I've had a lot of those, but considering all claim denials, there's still a minority of claims. I had one, it was a commercial warehouse and a, a, a tractor trailer rig kind of lost control, slammed into the loading dock and did about $6,000 worth of structural damage. They had a, an ISO building and personal property commercial policy form in place. Attached to that was a special causes of loss form, which is an all risk or open perils type form, which covers vehicle damage. How the adjuster denied it though was in the policy in the building and personal property form uh, under property not covered. And there was a line there that said, we do not cover damage to piers, wharves, pilings, or docks. And when you think about that, what are they talking about with piers, wharves, pilings, and docks? Waterfront property. That's what that, that's what that means, waterfront property. It doesn't apply to loading docks. The word docks just happens to be a word in common that they have. There is, I talk in the book, uh, in the section on ambiguities, there is a Latin phrase called nociter associus. It's Latin for it's known from its associates. It, in, in insurance uh, uh, legal cases, it's a very common premise for finding coverage. You, you look at a series of words or phrases or terms which are common in insurance policies because they have a list of perils or a list of exclusions and so forth. And you look for the commonalities among them. It's why some courts have found that pollution exclusions only apply to environmental pollution because the list of pollutants refer to uh, soot and vapors and chemicals and stuff like that, not to things like there was a court case uh, involving milk where they said uh, they tried to deny it based on milk being a pollutant. What happened was a, a milk truck overturned, spilled into a trout ranch pond and killed all the fish. And they said pollution, uh, that milk was a pollutant as far as the fish were concerned. Well, some courts will uphold those decisions and others won't. And when they don't, it's usually that nociter associus thing. I've used it dozens and dozens and dozens of times to get claim denials reversed for that, that very example that I gave. The big one, though, is there's a legitimate difference of opinion. The, uh, if you've ever seen the movie The Princess Bride, one of my favorite movies, there is a character that all through the, the movie keeps throwing out this word, inconceivable. Every time something happens, he says, inconceivable. And the Inigo Montoya, the main character, keeps, keeps telling him, you keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. And that's often true with insurance. What does, a, what does the word vermin mean in a homeowner's policy if it excludes damage caused by bird, vermin, rodents, and insects? What, what is a vermin? I've seen claim denials of damage caused by turtles, snakes, hawks, alligators, on and on and on, on the basis that they're all vermin. So I wrote an article about this years ago uh, and did a bunch of court case research. Could not find a single court case in, uh, in the American court system where the word vermin had ever been upheld to deny a claim. Every time they said it was ambiguous because if you look at the dictionary definition of vermin, it's different in every dictionary. Some will say an owl is a vermin. 
uh, or, or other types, types of creatures. And then others will say a weasel is a vermin. Nobody really knows what a vermin is. So uh, d d one of the things that ISO did in 2011 in their homeowner's policies is they got rid of the, the word because it's, it's ambiguous and nobody could agree on, on what it means. So I'm going to give you, this is the audience participation time. I'm going to split the, the group right down the middle. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show everybody a sketch, a, a drawing. And I'm going to show the same sketch to both sides of the room, but I'm going to do it separately. I'm going to ask one side to close their eyes while I show it to the other, and then vice versa. And then there's, there's a point to this. So this side of the room, your right side, everybody close your eyes, no peeking. I'm going to show this to the left side. Okay, you can open your eyes. Now the left side of the room, everybody close your eyes. Okay, open your eyes. What did you see? It's a frog and a horse. It depends on rotate the frog counterclockwise and, uh, and it becomes a horse. Rotate the horse clockwise and it becomes a frog. The point I make with this is that you looked at exactly the same picture or sketch and you saw two totally different things because the perspective that you used to look at it was different. Same thing with insurance contracts. When two people can read the word vermin and see two totally different things, it doesn't mean that one's right and one's wrong until you have to decide whether the claim is covered or not. And then it's who can make the best argument. What, what I do in my book is basically tell people how to try a case without going to court. It's the scales of justice. You think of every reason that you can think of why there should be coverage. The adjuster thinks of every reason they can think of why it isn't covered. And the scale tilts in one direction or another, hopefully. And if it stays right in the middle, if it's just a, a, an argument that's strong on both sides or weak on both sides, the policyholder wins. And that's, that's the way it is in the court system. For the average consumer, it's uh, another Latin phrase, contra pro forentum, which means that insurance policies are written by insurance companies, not by consumers. So since the insurance company wrote the policy, if a court determines that the term is ambiguous, the policyholder who didn't write the contract wins. So all you have to do is try to demonstrate that something is ambiguous if you want to find coverage. Uh, an example of that, if you ever saw the movie Black Sheep with Chris Farley and David Spade, to me this is like it was on yesterday. You've, this was probably before you were born. I don't know when this movie came out. Probably the 90s maybe. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're in a cabin and a boulder comes crashing through the cabin. I've been involved in several claims involving boulders. And the question is whether that's covered or not. Some insurance policies on a name perils basis will cover things like falling objects. I had one case where a boulder rolled down to a cliff, bounced, and then came through the roof. So it was a falling object. It would have been covered there. Uh, in open perils, everything's covered that's not excluded. So that would have been covered under most open perils policies, except they all, property policies, all have an earth movement exclusion. It's in there because of the catastrophic exposure. If you have a, an earthquake in Los Angeles, thousands and thousands of homes could be damaged. You can bankrupt a company. So they don't want to cover it on everything. So the question is, if you have a boulder damage, is it earth movement or not? And without going into a lot of detail, every case that I've been involved with involving boulders, we've gotten the company to pay it. And we used arguments like, what is earth movement? Look, courts will refer to dictionaries. If you look up the word earth, it refers to soil, rocks. It's a plural term. It's not a single boulder, one big rock. Otherwise, you know, how big does the rock have to be before it is or isn't covered? If, if a boulder is earth movement, and you get narrow and narrow and smaller and smaller till you get down to a boulder that's the size of a rock you can hold in your hand. What happens when a vandal throws that rock through a window? Most property policies cover vandalism, but they exclude earth movement. So isn't that rock flying through the air earth movement, just like the boulder that flew through the air is earth movement? So we use logic in, in, in trying to explain what the language actually means. Or I was in Phoenix and they had a sandstorm. Well, sand, you could argue, is earth. But you have windstorm coverage in most policies. Would it be excluded because it's movement, earth movement? 
And uh, th there's a, a, a fine line between logic and language. It doesn't always work, and time permitting, I'll give you an example of that. Resolution. This is the lady who will be doing the keynote at the end of the day, Amber. She was, uh, I used to, to give away RTFP t-shirts, which RTFP stands for Read the Policy. <laughs> or if you must, read the full policy. <laughs> So th this is the process. Step zero is quality controlling the denial. Every state has unfair claim settlement practices, bad faith laws, etc. Again, usually not a big deal, but I see a lot of claim denials that don't comply with legal requirements because they don't follow what the law requires in, in being in writing, explaining uh, what happened, what part of the policy applies, uh, 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 wh why the policy applies, etc. If we had an hour, I could go into that, but some of them don't comply there. And even though the claim might not be covered, they still have to meet that statutory or regulatory requirement for properly denying the claim. The real resolution it gets into a four-step process. You read the policy. Hopefully, you already know the policy that you're underwriting, selling, or adjusting. Then you research and interpret the policy. There are all kinds of resources that are out there, and I talk about those in the book. The International Risk Management Institute has incredible interpretive resources. FCNS Bulletin's a product of the National Underwriter. There are experts out there. I, I do a lot of uh, consulting work in, in cases of that type. The step three is document your interpretation, and what I wanted to, to wrap up with is step four, pleading your case, where you're actually trying to convince the adjuster that it's covered if they've denied it, or if you're on the claim side, you know it's not covered. You've got to convince the agent, the consumer, whomever, the policyholder, that it's not covered and explain what you mean by that. All right, I got 10 minutes left. Forms and facts matter. Language and logic, I mentioned a little bit early. Bob Smith was a, an old educator, he's still around, he's in his 90s now, uh, from Florida. And he said, if you can't argue the form, argue logic. If you can't argue logic, argue the form. And the best way is to argue the language and the policy using logic, combine the two together. And it work, works both ways, as we'll see. Here's a quote uh, that shows that uh, what what a policy provision means can vary from the circumstances in which the claim happened. I mentioned riding lawnmowers earlier. These are the most recent three ISO homeowners policies. They're HO3, the most common form sold. Uh, 1991, 2000, and 2011 were the th most, three, most recent three edition dates. And just to give you an example, here are two homes side by side. There's a driveway, there's a driveway. The property line runs right down the middle of that grass strip between the two driveways. So you're mowing the grass under, and you run over the, 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 uh, the screwdriver I mentioned earlier to kill a kid across the street. There's a lawsuit. You're looking for coverage under your homeowner's policy. Is it covered or not? The 1991 form excluded motor vehicles but made a few exceptions. One of them is any vehicle used to service an insured residence. So as long as you had a riding lawnmower and at some point you mowed your yard, you could actually be using that riding mower anywhere. I, where I used to live, there was a guy that used his John Deere and a flatbed wagon to pull two-year-olds down the street Halloween trick-or-treating, which isn't very smart, but he, he did that. If he had an accident, there'd be coverage under his policy as long as at some point he used it to service his premises. Well, ISO said that's too broad. The, the carriers that, that, that subscribe to ISO said that's too broad. So in 2010, they said we only cover accidents involving motor vehicles used solely to service an insured's residence. Look at that property line. If I'm mowing, if I live here and I'm mowing the grass, I'm not going to mow along the property line. I'm going to mow the whole grassy strip. And when my neighbor mows the yard, he's going to mow the whole grassy strip. If I mow on the other side of that property line, I no longer am using that vehicle to solely service my residence premises. As a result, I never have any coverage after that. Once I've mowed on that grass strip, I run over a screwdriver two weeks later in my front yard and kill somebody, I have no coverage under the 2000 ISO form because of that one word solely. We, when ISO changed this, uh, lobbying on behalf of independent agents, I asked them, I said, well, what if I buy a new riding mower? They said, well, now you have coverage because that motor vehicle has not been used 
to, or has been used to solely service your premises. I haven't mowed anything yet with that. 2011, they said, okay, maybe that is a little strong. What we'll do is we'll change it to solely service any residence. Now I've got coverage again. So imagine trying to explain that to a consumer. That if, you, if you're an independent agent, you represent several homeowners carriers, each with these different policy additions. One covers it, another doesn't cover it, another does cover it. it. This isn't an easy industry. It's a very complex industry. It depends on the forms and the circumstances as to whether something is covered or not, and, and, and often that's the case. One other example, I've got seven minutes left. Here's a couple with a homeowner's policy. They have a hot tub. And they use the hot tub all year round. And uh, one particularly bad period, they had a, an extended, very frigid time period. And the, the piping, the plumbing to it froze and the pump froze. It was like $1,500, $2,000 worth of damage. Put in a homeowner's claim. The homeowner's, claim, the homeowner's policy has an exclusion for damage that results from the freezing of the plumbing system. So the adjuster denied the claim. Well, when you look at the policy language, the policy says we don't cover freezing of a plumbing system, but we will cover it if you've done one of two possible things. One is to shut off the water supply and drain the system, which they hadn't done because they use this thing usually all winter long. The other one is maintain heat in the building. And they had, they lived there, so they, they've had heat all winter, including that spell. The adjuster's response is, well, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter that they kept heat on in the building. It, this was outdoors and it froze. So it's illogical that, that there would be coverage, that that exception would apply, but the exception does apply because that's what the policy says. The contract language clearly says if you maintain heat in the building and you have damage that's caused by freezing of plumbing, it's covered. So what do you do if you're the insurance company? You pay the claim, and this is a real claim, it happened just but from last winter that we got the company to claim. You pay, pay, you, you pay the claim, then you go back to the prevention thing that I talked about a minute ago, and you <coughs> modify the policy, you change the policy language. Because that's, that really is an illogical conclusion that you wouldn't want to cover outdoor plumbing. Well, you go back and change the policy. And that's exactly what this company did. To their credit, I have a lot of occasions, I've had companies say, all right, you've got a point. We're going to pay the claim. We're going to go back and revise the policy language. And that's, that's the way you do it. You look for coverage in the policies and you try to pay the claims if there's a reasonable basis for, for doing that. Uh, 17 contractual principles I just mentioned. This is in the book. I go, I spent 100 pages talking about these. These are all premises and logic arguments I've used to get claims paid. And again, if you're on the other side, if you're on the claim side, you can use many of these to justify why you're denying a claim. But the big one, I call it the mother of all claim resolution disputes, is ambiguities. If you look at court cases involving insurance coverage, they almost always have some element of ambiguity. That's one of the claims where they're seeking coverage is that a policy provision is, is, uh, is ambiguous. And I wish we had time, I'd give you some pretty interesting examples, but we, we don't. One part of uh, step four again, of pleading your case, there's Dalton again. He had three rules at the, uh, the double deuce, which was the roadhouse where he worked. Expect the unexpected, take it outside. And I don't mean have a fist fight between the adjuster and the, the policy holder, but uh, take it outside the courtroom, resolve it before. The big thing is be nice, be professional. I've been involved in, in dispute resolutions where it wasn't nice. And uh, that's uh, from the agency side, you never treat an adjuster that way. It is the toughest job in the industry because no matter what you decide as an adjuster, somebody's not gonna be happy either the policy holder and the agent or perhaps your manager where you work. So it, it's important that you, you be considerate, you be nice, and you be professional. You can get a lot done, particularly from the logic standpoint, when you, when you do that. Uh, here's a cartoon of a guy talking to a psychiatrist and says, if you weren't so stupid, you could figure out why so many people don't like me. Well, that's, that's not the attitude you take with each other in a, a dispute resolution. Uh, that's, I wish I had time, but I, I don't. If you, if you can't convince the adjuster, if you're looking for coverage, there are 
steps you can take beyond that, going to the supervisor, the manager, going to the home office. I've been involved in some frustrating claims. I claim a success rate of over 90%, and I, I truly believe that that uh, never tabulated everyone, but I think over 90% of the time, if you can convince the adjuster that something's covered, they will back off and pay the claim. And again, that's, that's the credit to the professionals that are doing those jobs. They'll pay it and revise the policy most of the, of the time. Sometimes it doesn't work. You have to go to the regulators. In Tennessee, I, I used to go to the insurance department in Tennessee regularly to get help. Not, not all with every claim, but sometimes they were so frustrating in the denial. I, w I wish I had more time. I would give you a couple of examples of just incredible claim denials that we had to go to the insurance department because they were clearly covered and, and, and get them paid. And every now and then, last resort, Dickie Scruggs is an attorney who made about a billion dollars suing uh, cigarette companies. And I had a claim denial that where he wrote a letter and the claim was paid in about two weeks because a guy who, of his stature, well, he's, he's in prison now, but that's an, another story. <laughs> so that, this is my last slide. There is my website. I, uh, I'm borrowing the farmer's commercial. Uh, I know a thing or two because I've seen, seen a thing or two. I've been doing this for 50 years. I have a website that I blog from. There is my email address. If you ever have any questions, if you're looking for a sounding board of uh, things that you're thinking about doing or whatever, feel free to email me every time. And again, if, uh, if you would like a copy of my book, the ebook, the Kindle version, write your email address on the card that I passed out and, and just lay it up here at the projector as you leave and I will send you an Amazon code for that. All I ask is that you do it legibly, your email address. And with that, minute early, I'm done. Thank you.